Good morning. I'm sorry to disturb your uh, post-coffee chat, but thank you for coming along to this hidden room mm -hmm. uh, in the corner. You are special. You have found it. So hopefully uh, we'll have a, a compact and interesting session of around 90 minutes. We're running three minutes late. I don't want to be too obsessive about timing. Um, uh, but let's, let's make sure that we have a good amount of time to exchange on the issues. So let me just uh, make an introduction in case you're in the wrong room, <laughs> first of all. Uh, the topic here is trust and trade across borders. And I'm even reading Shaping the Future of International E-Commerce from Developing Countries. So my name is James Howe. I'm a senior advisor at ITC. I run a, a small team that does a few things. And one of them uh, that's uh, uh, getting more and more of our attention and other people's attention is some very pragmatic support that we're working on a program to support developing and least developed countries, small and micro-sized firms in those developing countries uh, overcome barriers to using e-commerce. So we play in a different space. And so I think the way that we speak about it may be a bit different than you hear in other fora because we really are, we're trying to represent the voice and the needs of SMEs and how to get them in international trade. That's I ITC's uh, core mandate. Um, and uh, we, in, in various seminars, we've seen that there, there is uh, a focus when we talk about trust on uh, some of the technical aspects and indeed a lot of the public debate at a high level can be on topics which seem very esoteric when you're a, a micro enterprise in a developing country. Very, very important issues as they are, such as data delocalization or even cybersecurity or even some of the international debates seem very far removed from the kind of problems that, you, that you're faced with immediately to create a viable business, to get your goods online and get paid and get deliveries happen uh, because, and there's lots of problems which we'll go through, but a core underlying problem um, is the issue of trust, which is an animal that has different faces. So there's the technological uh, aspects, there's the legal aspects, and what we said we'd have a little bit of fo a focus also, and that's not to neglect those very important aspects, but also the behavioral, societal aspects which come together and how these play off one another. Oh, there we are. Did you click? So let me introduce, somebody did the quick for me. That's yeah, brilliant. That's, an MBE. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, develop, yeah. Um, so let me introduce the speakers. Uh, I have Adam uh, Schlosser here on my right hand side, probably on your left hand side, uh, who's from the World Economic Forum. And Adam, uh, well, pardon, Adam will uh, uh, focus on the view on how technology is changing and how this how this impacts the topic that we're talking about, trust and trade. In the middle of our session, we'll have uh, some testimonial from Africa in two parts. Firstly, uh, Maria, uh, who worked with us earlier on this year on her thesis in this area, and she is, I, I, I misunderstood, she's still in Zenith Bank, so we can drop the word former. She's based in Nigeria, so and has come over to give us this view about the, the, what, the, what those issues are and tr about trust seen from an African point of view. And then uh, we'll pass to uh, Korotum, who's on my right here, who uh, will present us what the African Post is doing about this, a very pragmatic area of helping small firms uh, and, and how the Post can support that. Uh, and finally, and only available online, um, is 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 uh, Mar uh, Hannah uh, from eBay, um, who will who will uh, give us some lessons uh, from the past of of how micro enterprises have built their present, but also the current state with eBay, how how uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises are being uh, are being helped in building their cross border business. So I think so. Right. And so this. Uh, forms a, a background. Earlier this year we did some research uh, interviewing around 2,000 SMEs through our network 
uh, around the world in developing least developed countries, but also developed countries to find out what the realities are, what it feels like in the voice of small enterprises. Why exactly is it, is it so difficult uh, when we can sit here in Geneva and have debates about what the WTO should be doing and what uh, the member states should be doing? Uh, that how, why is it still a problem uh, pragmatically for a micro business to get on and, and, and do e-commerce? And uh, we had a number of findings in that, uh, and some of which will become apparent as I move forward. But there, there are a series of other papers as well, which you can find and you can download, or you can contact me and I can give you the references over the last few years. We're not, ITC is not in uh, first, firstly a research house. We are very much involved with projects and project support, but we do occasionally put uh, pen to paper and produce something. So over the last few years, we've looked at e-commerce in China, which was supporting an ongoing project that we're doing about helping it market access into China for some of these uh, d developing countries. Uh, a report from our ongoing uh, SME competitiveness research work, we pulled out lessons on e-commerce in particular. Um, um, last year and a couple of years ago, we did something specific about Africa. So I just point out something that's a few years old and it really anticipates Hannah's uh, intervention at the end. Uh, because eBay did a lot of work with, with some analytical background that, to this, but supporting the notion that, th that it's possible today to launch yourself and be a micro-multinational out of your garage. And indeed, there's a lot of case history that shows this is possible uh, for big, uh, formerly developing countries such as India. Uh, there's a massive movement of companies starting small but very rapidly uh, developing substantial domestic and international business through uh, uh, e-commerce channels. But our observation is that this is not as easy as it seems. Uh, and I'll come to it in a moment, where I'll move on. Uh, we see in the background, this uh, element of trust is, is a big issue, and there's a great irony here. We see at the ex senior executive level, now this is another uh, view, this is a KPMG survey earlier on this year, of saying that building trust is, is, is pa among the biggest challenge here. This, as well as growing the business, which is uh, the normal preoccupation of chief executives, they, a third of them nearly see an issue in general, we're being very high level here, with trust. So there's something funny that's going on in the world while we have all this access to information and all this accessibility, you would think that trust would be driven by uh, social networks and the kind of information that we've got, but trust is, seems to be a general problem. So move on. And indeed, you know, looking more in the area of e-commerce, uh, here's, uh, um, a, tr a survey last year by uh, Ipsos, which, is, which confirms this among the general public. 80% of people across the, the world uh, find, are finding it hard to know who to trust. And we're in an age where that in does point to some kind of crisis. We can move on. Here's a survey which I commend to you. It's a very detailed survey commissioned by, um, uh, wor worked on by Ipsos as well, but on behalf of several uh, parties, including the global, uh, including the Center for International Governments and Innovation and the Internet Society and UNCTAD. And it's a very extensive report, 24,000 uh, internet users in 24 countries, and including some developing and least developed countries. And there's a mass of information there uh, about what the, what the issues are viewed from the consumer. I mean, this is not, this is, this is not the, the, the translation into what SME see. But you see this, I do not trust sh shopping online, 49% uh, of respondents, you know, a huge number. So this issue remains a huge issue. And in fact, the second one here on I have heard bad things about shopping online is, of course, linked about testimonial and the power of voice. You know, a quarter of people hear bad things about this. So we would point out that there are a number of simple things, and we've been through this before. Um, uh, uh, this is at the core of some of our work to identify this journey. Again, I should say this is from the SME's point of view, the small com companies, of moving between understanding, so understanding what is e-commerce, uh, which is very transparent. Anybody can go on and, and look at Amazon and very quickly you understand what is e-commerce. But what is more difficult to understand is the, the steps and the barriers to actually make this. So understanding what are the right products, understanding how to get the right quality of information as simply as photos and descriptions, 
actually achieving access to some of these markets. This is a thorny problem. We won't go much into detail. And we discuss it in other fora about some of these markets are simply closed, as is the availability of many common payment solutions. Transport remains difficult. Uh, anticipating duties and taxes is, uh, is an issue. Not having any visibility on these uh, uh, internationally is, of course, going to be a problem. The issue of costly and painful returns uh, is, is both damages margin, margins and can lead to disputes and, da and da uh, uh, damage to reputation. That is a journey simply from understanding to trust in our way of viewing things, you know, which, which you'll see we're not talking about very, uh, very complicated issues here in many cases. But another learning that comes about is that, th in a way, this is all linked to formalization. We'll come back to this, and this is one of my learnings over the last few years of working with these small companies. But actually, if you think about it, digital involves no room for ambiguity. It is a f it requires a major step into formalization of information. And again, I can explain more about that. And that underpins a lot of problems. All of those things involve uh, you being able to uh, have an identity online uh, and issues that we'll talk about a little bit more about, like having a security certificate and so on, revolve some changes in business attitudes and uh, behavior about a series of capabilities to do with formalization, formalizing what the product is called and its variations and so on. Uh, I'm speaking too long. Uh, I started late, but anyway, let me just say that there are, d there are these different areas that we can talk about and we can come back in our discussion. So trustworthy online presence, uh, payment solutions, customer support, terms and conditions, and security technology. So we'll just move on. So and we can click. Uh, so that we mean by that, uh, stop a moment. So this is about professionalism, as I've mentioned, transparency of what's available, testimonials, and we do work to help understand that and, and, and uh, with small firms that they can start to benefit from, from being professional, being transparent, and getting testimonials. Payment solutions is a, is a technical area, but if you, if, you, if you can't have your business registered, if you can't be part of a, uh, a, a certified authority which recognizes your business, you're going to find it very difficult to get payment solutions in many of these countries. Behaviors, so responding to customers in a timely way and correctly uh, is a behavioral thing, but there's also organization behind it of having databases uh, and m monitoring customer information. So clear terms and conditions. We talk about this in terms of you know national legislation, but there's also conformity to that, uh, developing a privacy policy and developing clear terms and conditions. So these are things that we try and coach on uh, and make available. And then, of course, te security technologies that we'll come to a little bit about how those, those can be accessed. I'll mention a couple of things. Uh, we did a case with uh, work with the Swiss partner, Swiss Sign, which is the Swiss Post, but is also the Swiss Rail organization now, about simply recognizing the identities of firms and then getting them a digital, uh, a, a verified digital signature. And this opens up a number of things to them, as indeed our colleagues from Estonia, who have a very interesting program called the e-residency, which allows you have to visit uh, an Estonian mission, uh, make an application, and you can, uh, in effect, get access to a verified identity with a PIN code, and that opens up lots of possibilities in terms of banking and so on. So I will stop there. That's pretty rapid. Uh, I don't want to speak too long, uh, my, and we can come back on these issues. So I will pass out with that. Pass over to Adam without much of a problem. Hope you don't pass out yet. It's yeah, too pass early. Out, yeah. Have some, have some cafe. No, no, no. All right. Well, well, thanks so much for including me on this great panel today. Um, I'll, I'll, my presentation, as James alluded to, will be looking at the impact of on trade of new emerging technology in some ways that tra uh, technology can be used to improve trust and also development. I'll also touch briefly upon data protection uh, and then cover some of the uses of this new technology. And I promise to do all that in seven minutes or less. Awesome. Or you can. You could yell at me. So um, technology really is moving faster than, than ever before. Uh, presentation. Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, new, the new speed of technology is combining different uses, um, different applications to create an exponential amount of, of benefits in ways that weren't even thought possible a few years ago. So for example, the iPhone is only about 10 years old. I mean, and when it first came out, it was a novelty. Oh, our friends are online. They're checking their email. Or they couldn't even check their email. They went to, they're, they're going and checking sports scores. It's great. But now we can't even imagine traveling without it. The idea of printing out maps before you go somewhere is just crazy. You just pop, pop out your phone and you're able to connect online. Years ago, 
buying something online was something to be afraid of. A few wouldn't do that. And now we just do it on our phone. I remembered, oh, I, I need to, to get a present for someone for Christmas. I did it on my phone and had it sent two days later back home when I was here in Switzerland and my home is in San Francisco. So it's really incredible the amount of commerce that's being unleashed just from the application of, of mobile devices. Uh, and the, the possibilities from there are, are endless when you combine new types of technology. So I just want to briefly touch upon uh, emerging technology such as blockchain that's really facilitating chain, tra uh, trade. And blockchain is, is a bit of a, a magic cure-all for everything from saving the environment to uh, stopping illegal fishing to anything that you can, you can think of, improving healthcare. Uh, and the one area that really is doing good work is, is in the trading system. And, and the exciting thing about speaking at the, the IGF versus a, a trading conference is that I, I hopefully don't have to explain the, the differences between blockchain and Bitcoin to, to this audience because it's a pretty, pretty advanced. So there, there's a, a difference between a cryptocurrency and a distributed ledger technology. And uh, the blockchain is being used in the world of trade finance so that when goods arrive at port, the trade finance can automatically be updated and work smoothly. The smart contract can self-execute to show that, all right, the goods, and you can put an IoT tracker onto the goods, uh, the moment they cross into port, into that jurisdiction, the attached paperwork, the attached financing automatically uploads and the process just proceeds smoothly. And then if you could incorporate AI to that process, you can show that, all right, based on the information provided in this, in this good or the size of the shipment, we can say, all right, this is less likely to have fraud. Or you can say, well, in, a, in the last 20 instances, when this category is left open in the trade document, there's a good chance that there's something weird or fraudulent going on here. So it can better direct resources to try to determine and try to improve trust to say when packages and goods and services are, are might be fraudulent or might be something awry versus how to smooth and really make the process more efficient and streamlined. So you can, in theory, create a fast lane for e-commerce from developing economies to say, all right, it's less than $200. It's from a trusted source in this government. We know that th it can just go through customs. And it, you avoid the situation where, where goods will often have to wait days or even weeks to clear a, a customs process. So uh, another area where technology is, is really helping, or I should say, there's not really even a distinction anymore between between goods and services. In the trading system, we often talk about trading goods, trading services, but today it's all it's all one really, and and all trade is digitalized. So even in in older industries, you wouldn't think of. So for example, uh, warehousing, uh, just getting your goods into port. So warehouses in the past were so big and so analog that if you moved a package literally three feet from its original location, you would lose it because you had no way to track where it was. And if there's hundreds of thousands of packages, how do you identify it? So applying Internet of Things trackers, industrial Internet, uh, is an easy way to smooth the process. Uh, in the past, trucks would have to wait 10 to 12 hours to see where their containers or the shipments came into port because they just had no way to predict what, what terminal they were arriving at. Uh, even in major ports, such as the city of Los Angeles, they have five different data systems internally. So you can imagine the level of inefficiency that that causes in a, in a fairly advanced industry. Um, all that being said, that creates an advantage for developing economies where they haven't incorporated the advanced data systems yet, so they can really leapfrog the developing countries and, and really, really move quicker. So that's a, a big advantage there. Um, a lot of these developments are really fueled by data. So I was just on a previous panel with, with your colleagues talking about data issues, so I won't go too deep there. But just to, to raise a, a question about when, when data crosses borders, there's not easy solutions out there. So for example, self-driving cars. Uh, imagine a situation where you have a US citizen driving a German car on a Japanese road. Well, obviously, there was some trade happening that got the, the car there, and the data is valuable. But what happens when the regulators, the safety regulators in all three governments say, you need to store that data locally, you need to report that data and keep it here? What happens when there's an accident? Where does that data go? Who Are you conflicting with two laws, three laws? So that's just a, an open question that's out there that some of the, the rules that are in place now are, are not entirely fit for keeping up with the rapidly evolving technology that, that's out there. So uh, one of the Moving on to the, the concept of, of trust, um, and this is something that came up in the, the last panel. One of, one of the 
biggest barriers to trust is a lack of financial and transaction data. So in, in, in Indonesia, only 36% of the population is, is banked, and only 23% has access to, to e-payments. So SMEs could have a really hard time getting financing because they lack credit history. So traditional credit reporting is only negative situations when you didn't pay a bill. But what happens when you've been paying cash for your utilities for several years? So you're, you're potentially a great client. I'd want to lend you money. I'd want to finance you because you're showing you're trustworthy. But how do you track that? How do you develop that? So it's really important to increase the level of banking, increase the level of, of e-payments, um, whether it's through systems like PayPal or M-Pesa. But getting people online is a great way to prevent, prevent and deter fraud. Um, and it's a way to do it through new, new technology. It's not as exciting or emerging as blockchain, but it's still emerging technology that's, that's very important to use. Uh, in, in developing economies, incidents of fraud are, are definitely higher. Uh, in, in Indonesia, again, the example is fraud is about 12 times higher than, than average. So people are, are deterred or are slightly worried about, about making purchases online. Um, in, in developing economies, we're, we're used to just going, we have credit cards, we have a bank account, so I'm not as worried about fraud because I know I can go to my credit card company, I go to my bank, say, stop that payment. So what do you do when the payments are, are done in cash? How do you track those situations? And a lot of these problems will get better with time as more and more people come online, but we're faced with a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So how do you get people online conducting more transactions to increase the transparency when they're worried about fraud? Um, So how can we how can we jumpstart this? And how can we create some improvements to improve the process? So one, governments can play a really key role. Uh, in particular, increase cross border cross border cooperation to prevent fraud, um, provide easy paths for dispute resolution. Um, they can create sandboxes to safely test and evaluate emerging technologies. So this is the example of blockchain for trade finance, um, ensuring that there's guardrails in place to be innovative and incorporate new technology while still ensuring public safety. And a lot of the developing economies now, they're in a place where their paperwork isn't even digital. So to digitalize paperwork, just put it in a PDF form, millions of dollars. And that's not even being able to scrub data sets out or just manually or electronically and, and efficiently add data. It's just literally scanning documents making PDFs. So why do that? Why even take that step? Just go right to the idea of, of being all digital, all electronic. It's a great opportunity. You're operating from a green space. You really leapfrog and avoid a, a stage that's not as, not as helpful. So I think there's a big opportunity there as well. Uh, and when governments are creating frameworks, it's important that they're technology neutral and function based. So indifferent to whether it's on a phone, a computer, the type of technology, um, open source, closed source, but focus instead on the, on the functions and services that are, are being offered. Um, they could also make it easy to comply with consumer protection rules, such as know your customer and any money laundering policies. However, it's not just a, a government solution that's out there. The private sector also needs to, to get involved. So platforms that are enabling e-commerce or enabling other transactions, B2B or B2C, can make dispute resolution easier to obtain, make consent rules visible, um, improve accessibility by having multiple language options, and vetting the people that are buying and selling on the site, maybe even taking uh, some escrow as, as well as a way there. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a government or a private sector solution. It's important that everyone cooperates. And combined with the advice and effort from the, the civil society, there's a, a clear path towards maximizing benefits of technology and trade, really answering the challenges that are out there, and both building trust both domestically and uh, across borders. Thanks. I don't know if I'm over seven minutes a little bit, but. OK. <laughs> so yeah, OK. I, I think the time is, is uh, obviously required uh, a lot to enter into a short amount of time so there was a lot of things there and I think uh, we should come back in some of the discussions and focus on uh, a few of the key ideas but we'll move on first of all and you know present uh, the basis of the discussion um, thanks Adam for being so brave and pass to Maria if I may all right Good day, everybody. Like James has said, I am Maria Umoran from Nigeria. I recently worked with the um, ITC on some issues concerning trust and um, digital commerce in um, Africa, and Nigeria in particular. 
and I would like to share some of my insights with us this morning. Like the earlier speaker has said, with um, the internet comes the ease with which, I hope I'm audible enough, the internet comes with the ease with which businesses can showcase their goods and services globally and um, have consumers uh, have access to them online. And it has become very fundamental to um, e-commerce transactions, e-commerce I mean, and right now in <coughs> B2C e-commerce is expected to hit um, $1.8 trillion um, dollars by the end of 2017. However, most of this is occurring in developed countries. And um, retail global e-commerce should increase four times the rate of retail sales, jumping to um, $2.2 trillion, and this represents about 23.2%. And by the end of this year, retail sales should represent about 10% of global um, retail sales, e-commerce retail sales, I mean. And this figure will get up to 4.4 trillion by 2021. However, with all these developments in Africa, it is still very low. E-commerce estimates recorded in Africa is still very low and it will be um, surprising to note that the total international B2C trade from Africa and the Middle East was estimated at 2.2% in 2014. <coughs> Despite the overwhelming uh, merits of doing business online with internet, we have several issues, several challenges in Africa, and some of them <coughs> could be seen in terms of poor technology, um, high access cost to connectivity. We have um, limitation in terms of identification and authentication of um, businesses. We have lack of government support, or the <coughs> and we also have issues with our educational system. Our payment systems are very poor, and we have most of all, the issue of trust, which is going to be um, what we will talk about this morning in more details. With the internet rapidly um, penetrating Africa, we actually think that Africa has a lot of potentials for um, e-commerce. <coughs> Population as at now is about um, estimated at 1.2 billion, and this represents about 15% of the world population. Our population is expected to hit about 2.4 by 2020. So it is hoped that with the ease of access to the internet, our huge population growth will give rise to exponential um, e-commerce growth, and businesses in Africa, small businesses do in Africa, will be able to seize the opportunity to. Um, sell their goods and services online. With increased access to electronic trust tools, we have the ESSL um, certificates, we have the SSL certificates, we have the all f some other forms of digital certificates. African businesses will be able to do um, business on the internet and we will be able to harness the potentials of e-commerce for um, going across borders to do uh, um, trade and showcase our business. In Nigeria, <coughs> we also have major issues that affect um, e-commerce. Right now, people are skeptical about um, doing businesses online. For instance, I will not want to um, pay for goods and, se and services ordered online until I have received the goods I have ordered because we have the problem of um, financial fraud we have situations where people's um, personal information are misused online. Of course, for us to complete transactions online, we need to use our cards. And your cards have your personal information, your house addresses, your phone numbers, your bank details. And putting this, all this information online is, causes a problem of internet crime. People, hackers, have access to this information. And then we have issues where people send you phishing uh, messages and some spurious messages that um, um, 
hacked into your account. We also have the issue of insufficient legal environment. We have no, absolutely no government policies that um, protect consumers. So it is a problem to carry out e-commerce in Africa and in Nigeria in particular. We also have limited technologies to support the confidentiality of consumer information online. We lack transparency and we have the problems of customer service. Like I said earlier, if I purchase the good online and it doesn't meet my specification, to return and get my good goods replaced is a problem. So the issue of customer service also impedes doing business online in Nigeria. There is also the issue in more, gen in, in, in more particular, um, the limited use of technology. We do not have access to technologies that support confidentiality and online transparency. Um, there's digital certificates um, required for you to be able to trade with businesses abroad. We have the extended validation um, SSL certificate, which is the highest form of certificate. Um, when um, a business has an ESSL certificate, it means that the certificate authority has conducted KYC and authenticated the identification of this business. In Nigeria, this is not available. We don't even have the basic SSL certificates, which is the basic one for businesses. And then we do not have the qualified electronic signatures for individuals, which is the, the um, like the ESSL for um, businesses. So it is pretty difficult and challenging to <coughs> be able to do business with the outside world. Now, the implication of doing business um, digitally in Nigeria comes with several issues. Because for businesses abroad to trust you, you need to have access to um, digital certificates. It is impossible in Nigeria because of some um, issues that we have. These digital certificate authorities are ma mainly West from the Western world, and they have very strict compliance procedures, which we cannot mm -hmm. adhere to in Nigeria. Cannot be met because there are several implications, such as cost. You have to pay for broadband, which is very expensive. You have to pay the certificate authorities, which is quite expensive. You have to pay subscription costs, which is quite expensive. And we also do not even have um, good um, payment options or for foreign payments. For instance, until recently, Nigerian cards could not be used to make purchases online. Right now, you can, but you are limited to $1,000 in a quarter. And you need to pay for these things online. So it is difficult for you to be able to use your Nigerian card to make a payment online. It's, we have um, credit cards too, but it is the high earned people who are like high net worth individuals who have access to credit cards. And most of them are not business people. So this is a very serious problem for us. And then um, the certificate authorities need to um, rely on somebody in Nigeria to be able to identify businesses. For instance, we have the Corporate Affairs Commission who is the registrar of all businesses in Nigeria. And the website of the Corporate Affairs Commission is not seen as a trusted website. So how do the certificate authorities authenticate the identity of businesses in Nigeria? These are the issues that we have. <coughs> the other issues that we have that concern that inhibit us from doing e-business or e-commerce e has to do with payment delivery systems. Now, um, I am afraid to use my card online because I don't want my um, details to be hacked because I don't want you to bring um, the wrong good for me, the wrong product for me because I might order a size 12 of shoes and then the delivery guy shows up with a size 10. I decide to pay you only when you have delivered and I am sure that the goods that you deliver to me are what I ordered. And then you bring it to me and I give you cash. The delivery person is saddled with the responsibility of carrying the cash from one delivery point to the other because mind you, he's not delivering just one product at a time. He probably has one, two, three, four, five people to deliver to. So he goes around with the cash. There is a problem that he might be robbed on the way 
If he is able to take the cash back to the office, he needs to take the cash to the bank to pay in. There is a high cost to processing cash. Now, who bears the cost of processing the cash? Is it um, the, uh, the person who bought the goods? Is it the person, the delivery company? Or is it the online company? These issues need to be looked into. So I feel that um, few, so few solutions could help us increase trust in online um, businesses, in, on, in doing business online. For instance, the government should be able to provide better and trusted online payment systems for um, people who are afraid to use their cards online. And then the compliance authorities, the, the compliance procedures for the certificate authorities should be adapted to the peculiarities of the environment. What I mean by this is, now, um, a certificate authority knows that the Corporate Affairs Commission in Nigeria does not have an ESSA, EVSSL certificate. How do we make sure that they can rely on what we have on ground to be able to identify businesses in Nigeria? There should be some kind of synergy at this point so that even though we have not been able to get access to the highest level of um, um, trust technology, we can meet halfway and um, be able to uh, uh, use the technologies that we have on ground. And then there should also be um, some awareness, education of the general public on the need to go digital as this is the way to go in the world. And finally, governments in Africa must be able to facilitate um, cross-border e-commerce um, e by creating laws and regulations that align with what is available globally, like the um, model law on electronic signature. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, thank you very much, Maria. Um, we will now move on to Kurutum Diabate, who is uh, uh, Director General of the Post from Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Madame Diabate is francophone, um, so she's made the great effort to translate her speech into English, uh, but I encourage her if she has any problems to, to, to use some French words, but uh, I'll, hand, I'll hand over. If there's any difficulty, uh, I'm sure we can understand some French. Okay. Thank you, Jens. Some historical background. It's important to remember the role that posts have played for decades for some centuries in both industrialized and developing countries. In many countries, the post has played a foundational role in terms of economic development and in terms of infrastructure. For the most advanced country, the post was and remained a portal for innovation and enabled for key technology since 200 years. In the context of e-commerce, Posts are playing similar role today. So instead of avoiding the potentially negative effect of the internet, posts have demonstrated a willingness to take advantage of the new opportunities. If you prefer, how can postal operators disrupt rather than be the disrupted? We can identify the post as a, dis uh, a trusted provider of messaging. In the e-commerce volume chain, Posts serve in role from the initiation of the purchase to the delivery. Dot post is a unique, unique internet space manage, managed by the UPU for its member and the porta, postal community. The dot post group is co collaborating project managed by the UPU, which unif unify regional initiative at the international level. Synergy between the modes of governance of the internet and postal regulation. Posts are operating in, in an ugly regulated environment, leading to a high level of reliability in terms of quality of product, delivery, information, and service, leading to a high level of trust and high level of expectation from customer. Regarding e-commerce and posts, we can raise here the importance of electronic data and exchange of data important to reinforce the level of trust. 
posts have a critical role to, to play. Indeed, the importance of a global network with the capa capability to offer reliability of data exchange globally. This is a way POST can play a role in the context of security and exchange of data and information management. All those aspects are crucial for e-commerce. For my colleagues in the most industrialized countries, the major impact of current regulation on POST is related to data protection. There is a real impact at the government level, not yet at the customer's level. Example of digital services set up by La Poste de Côte d'Ivoire. Poste de Côte d'Ivoire boutique, how does our e-shop work? The post hosts its products and services online. The post proposes as well other products that might, might, that might be relevant and interesting for internet users that such as books and school, school material. Once a customer make an online purchase via the website, Post Code d'Ivoire is in charge of the shipment to the point of delivery specified by the customer or to his home address. The location of to the customer is done via geolocalization to his virtual address composed by true dictionary words. Cross-border e-commerce strategy and initiative, Sanli Shop in Africa region. Sanli Shop, from the word in Malenke of act of buying and shop. Sanli Shop is another oriented marketplace dedicated to local projects with the aim of pro uh, promoting the craft sector. Small enterprises, including e-sellers, offer their products online. Once they sell a piece, Post Code d'Ivoire is in charge to pick up to pick the product up at the seller location and deliver into the buyer. Once again, the geolocalization of customer is facilitated by the solution door to door. Next project, we are investigating the virtual postal address. We will provide a postal address at a very attractive price and associated with additional services. MPOS, Beyond Mobile Mo Banking Postal Mobile Money. We have set up the MPOS project mobile money solution, an application allowing all citizens to send and receive money via mobile phone without the need for a bank account. The citizen MPOS account become an account for financial transaction, a real electronic wallet facilitating a range of domestic activities. This service allows us to make up for the delay in extending the network of contact point, postal outlet, outlet franchised offices, establishing the, uh, the ecosystem of our national digital economy, network of merchant, retailer, distributor, and payment e-commerce. One of uh, the, important, the most important aspect of this vast program is to, to enable financial inclusion. The fight against poverty through e e access to banking services and financial education, etc. Role of the post in trade across bo border in developing country. For the postal community, dot post it is the abuse extension for all transnational electronic services. The security and trust associated with point post drives adoption and increases. Use, usage. In regard to the numerous ambitions of UPU member country, it seems very clear that the post remains a major and strategic player in achieving, in achieving the objectives of sustainable development. The post in the social link between the citizen and the state. It is precisely this reason that has mot motivated us in Cote d'Ivoire to design a new industrial postal project based on the concept of the post as provider a service to citizens. In conclusion, some obstacles we need to withdraw. Setting and promoting website, digital divided, literacy, almost uh, trust and confidence in the, in the online payment system. In Africa in general, in and in Cote d'Ivoire in particular, the online buyer is more willing to pay for goods once 
he received them. This is a key issue of trust. It will be highly beneficial to set up a payment system at the point of delivery, such as cash on delivery on, or better by electronic means. More specifically, for Africa, one of the most interesting trends is the high rate of penetration of mobile technology and devices for post. For post in the region, coupling mobile, mobile payments and delivery with proof, proof of identity, identity is definitively a concept that African post are investigating. Technology is everywhere now in the environment of the postman. For instance, with, with new mobile devices to capture information at the source from the collection point to the delivery point. Mobile service device, mobile self device and internet of thing are a central piece of flag management on a daily basis to understand for to understand the most effective route to follow for mail and parcel distribution. Thank you for your intention for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, so we've had an African interlude in two parts, uh, and we'll come back to some of these uh, very practical points that were mentioned, and I'll pull out a couple of things there which we can discuss in a little bit, perhaps to understand a little bit better. But first, um, we'll pass over to Hannah who, who from, from eBay, who should be online. Hannah, hi. You got, you, uh, for the audience, you'll have to listen in the headphones, apparently. So there you go. Hannah, we're just putting on our headphones. Try again. Yes, we can hear you. Oops.
Thank you very much, Hannah. Okay. So if I can uh, make the passage now into a period, we have about half an hour left of the, of the session. And we're open for questions and hopefully a discussion with you. But let me just give you a little overview of where we've been. So I made an introduction about the different kind of problems that SMEs have about getting on. And I mentioned the fact that one of the underlying, the linkages between this is certainly when we're talking about developing and least developed countries is informality in different ways. And we heard about this uh, from uh, Maria who mentioned the idea of ordering a size of uh, size 12 pair and getting a size 10 pair. So it's just, it's, seems a trivial uh, example, but it's about the second aspect that Hannah mentioned about reliability and logistics systems. Uh, and my comment that uh, digital requires something obvious, but actually quite difficult for in many of these cultures is a precision, is moving towards being pr very exact. So the, the size 12 pair is, as Adam mentioned in the warehouse somewhere, precisely tagged, precisely known, it's ordered uh, with, a, uh, with accuracy and delivered with accuracy. We see the problem of informality, we mentioned it in having access to secure uh, certificates. Firms who don't have, have access to this or indeed certification authorities which aren't set up in a secure way with, with themselves with uh, EV SSL certificates let the system down. So we move to a, v a requirement that the different parts of the value chain in e-commerce need to have some formalization. But without going on further, I would like to open up, do we have any questions or comments from the floor? Um, can I start, uh, I saw a, a hand go up here and then we can pass to Michael and perhaps over here. So at the end of the room. Thank you very much. And um, my name is Mary Udum, I'm from Nigeria. Um, I coordinate the Nigeria Internal Governance Forum. And one of the issues we, we talked about during our 2017 Internal Gov Governance Forum was Internal Governance for Economic Recovery and Growth in Nigeria. And I want to say categorically, um, I, I, I concur with most of the things sent by Maria, but the truth is that people still are doing business online is happening. Um, the scale is upscaling every year and uh, we have e-commerce businesses springing off in Nigeria in spite of the difficulties. But within the nation, we still have these things growing. One of the things that I would like to see is if there are SMEs in Nigeria that want to, uh, that that w that are e-commerce uh, organization or businesses that would trade with those in say Europe. Will you trust us enough that when y you can order our goods from Nigeria or from Africa? We have, um, we have literacy issues, we have infrastructure issues, quite all right. We have, uh, we have um, 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 lack of, um, capacity, but in spite of that, it's growing, e-commerce is growing. Even in the West Africa, when we had our West Africa uh, uh, IGF, we talked about e-commerce within the, within the region. If we can't go to Europe or America, can't we trade within ourselves? So there are issues, is there anything te technology can do to help us upscale our e-commerce and be able to overcome all those issues that, that will be drawing down or that will be waging or creating a barrier for cross-border trading in e-commerce or data uh, flow across the borders. So those are things. And uh, again, um, we, we as much as possible want to create jobs for our, our, for our people in, the, in our country. So uh, we want to look forward to where we will be exporting and we'll be doing e-commerce e, e, e across the borders. Thank you. I'll be leaving because I have another, <laughs> another, uh, another event or uh, another session. So that's why I try to make this comment and ask those questions. Thank you.
Okay, it's a, it's a shame that you won't be there for the answer, because otherwise <laughs> there were a few things there that I could put up. Uh, but you'll probably see the report of the session later on. I can pass to Michael, thank you. Uh, okay. Hi, good morning, thank you. Um, Michael Kendi. Um, so I was wondering the interaction between uh, and the roles of government and businesses in generating the trust. And this was kind of driven home. I live here in Switzerland. I bought something online recently, and they didn't. It was uh, online tickets, and I didn't get the tickets I wanted. And I realized I have no idea who to go, who I would go to in the government to get better tickets, or if there was really a problem. And eventually, the company gave me the right tickets. And I don't know if that's because they were worried about what I would do, or that they just wanted to. Um, you know, generate trust. And there's no doubt that the companies uh, like eBay have done, qu it wasn't eBay, uh, there's no doubt that companies like eBay have done a lot to generate trust. Uh, and we heard some description. But I'm wondering in a country like Nigeria, th does the government have to take the first steps to generate strong laws so that the consumers have recourse and start to generate trust? Or is it really more for the online platforms to develop um, a reputation that you don't even need to go to the government because they'll take care of the issues. Um, so I just wondered that interplay between the, uh, the government and, and um, the role of businesses in generating the trust. That's a good question. Thank you. The lady in the middle. Yeah. Um, I'm Valérie Sumo from Prana Sustainable Water. And what we do, we digitalize and commoditize treated wastewater. But my background is 24 years of uh, soft commodity trading, uh, mainly to and from Africa and Central and, and, and South America. And at the beginning of my career, I concretely was going to the farmer and then exporting, following the process, the papers, and so on. But the last year, I've seen the multiplication, also via the blockchains, of uh, mistakes. So, for example, if there is one mistake at the origin, the mistake is replicated. And then it comes to the fact that the, the buyer is waiting for his goods, and the goods are totally different, or, or even with fake warehouse receipt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the problem of, of trading is now the question of liability. 20 years ago, when you had a warehouse receipt, for example, from SGS, it was certifying that the goods are in the warehouse. Now they uh, change into a monitoring system without any liability. And the problems become bigger and bigger. I've been working with top firms that I would not name, uh, dealing with US sanctioned clients. And everything goes via a process of customs and so on without any problem. The payment goes via the big banks in the United States for the US sanctioned clients, there's no problem. So how uh, can we uh, secure the system of blockchains uh, embedding all the laws and mm -hmm. stopping sometimes? It can be uh, a vessel of, let's say, uh, worth uh, $40 million uh, of, of any goods, and nobody wants to stop the operation, not the banks because their, their money is, uh, is afloat, uh, not the clients because he needs his, his goods, uh, not, not the supplier because he needs to be paid. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can uh, we embed the, 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 the rules? Because today, as you know, the trading is in the hand of the big players, and they're above the laws. Sorry to say, but it's a reality. So is the blockchain... I know that it's very efficient, for example, for, for oil, because all the actors are, are quite big and, and it's difficult to, to do wrong things. But think about uh, cargoes of uh, cotton, cocoa, sugar. Those goods are quite difficult to... <laughs> we can track them by blockchain, but we can also make a lot of mistakes because of the blockchains. Valerie, thank you. Uh, maybe take a couple more, and maybe we should respond. But I think there was a there was I move over this. I'll come back over here. Um, so there's a few more. There was a lady who had a hand up earlier, but perhaps at the end. Okay. Um, my name is Adora. I'm from Nigeria. 
and um, an Internet Society ISOC um, ambassador. So I wanted to share an experience that we have in Nigeria and wondering how we can possibly for developing um, economies perhaps bridge that gap or in the meantime look for a way other models to um, help. So in Nigeria we have this system called pay on delivery and um, basically because a lot of consumers or a lot of um, purchasers don't necessarily trust the system like we mentioned some of those issues um, payment issues sometimes you don't ha you, you don't have um, return guarantees to return if there's any problem with the product so they came up with this system of pay on delivery where even though you buy something online you ne you don't make payments until um, the goods are delivered at the point of delivery but recently a lot of the major online retailers have stopped that system because they've had issues with it they have been security issues and some other issues so, so they stopped the pay on delivery system and i'm wondering in the meantime because right now a lot of nigerians don't necessarily trust um the online systems we, we are still trying to build that trust and it might take us a while to do that so in the meantime could there be any innovative ways or innovative models like the pay on delivery that might work till we get to that place where a lot of people would not mind putting their cards online or purchasing things from out of the country without having any issues. Is there any way we can bridge that gap until we get to that point? Okay, thank you. Perhaps move along here logically up the rules. Uh, sir, would you like to say your name? And so thank you, my name is Michael. I'm from the Pan-African Postal Union. Uh, my comment goes to the two presenters from Africa, I would just want to know what has been their experience in uh, cross-border trade within Africa and how did they manage with the customs because this is one of the areas that you have problems exchanging goods between countries. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We can move along. With Hello, my name is Gabriel Souza. I'm from Brazil, representing the youth program. So here we talked about uh, um, SL, SSL certificates and uh, security protocols. So I've been wondering if uh, we can produce or uh, make standards about quality assurance. So uh, how we can assurance quality of the on trades and in build trust uh, in, the, in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. And perhaps finally. Uh, Thank you, uh, Habib Hadri from uh, Tunisia. So we know there are uh, some uh, private or public uh, sector from uh, uh, digital uh, certification or uh, internet service provider or payment uh, uh, service provider or also some organization from uh, consumer uh, protection they launched the trusted seal so how uh, this uh, trusted seal can contribute uh, for a better confidence between uh, merchant and uh, consumer thank you thank you very much well okay that's a nice uh, group of questions if we can look at some of the perhaps hand them back to some of the uh, the, the, the panelists um, uh, michael asked about the role of governments uh, and uh, setting this trust would uh, would perhaps Perhaps, Marie, do you want to say something about that? Okay. Let me um, say something about that. Michael, like, um, <coughs> the problem now is in two um, phases. Like Mary earlier said, the first um, person who commented, in Nigeria, we are actually upscaling um, in e-commerce, so to say, online um, buying and selling. But now the issue is, it is just amongst ourselves. So we are trying to find out how do businesses in Nigeria relate with consumers abroad? How do we upscale such that we do not just sell to ourselves, we sell to people from abroad because we have goods and services that other people might be interested in. But the issue is they wouldn't trust us to the point of doing business with us online because they haven't seen the product that you're offering they are just waiting and trusting that when the product is delivered to them, it is what they want it to be. So now we need the government 
in this situation where you have to do business with people abroad in like i said in my presentation one of the solutions that i think will help um doing online business in Nigeria is that businesses upgrade understanding of how trust is built through communication. By that I mean quality and design of website, their customer service. This will help with doing business with Nigerians. I have a Nigerian business I want to sell to people in Nigeria. This will help if I trust that <coughs> your customer service is on point, if I trust that if I pay you online, you're going to deliver to me, if I trust that <coughs> if I order a size 10 shoes, you're bringing me a size 10 shoes, I will be comfortable to um, buy from your website or buy on your website, as, as it were. But if somebody abroad needs to buy from Nigeria, there are the intricate issues of um, trust that have to be met. For instance, I go on um, a company website and I see that he doesn't have the EF EVSSL certificate. It is very um, unlikely that I, as a business abroad, will want to do business with this person in Nigeria, considering the perception that you know people abroad have about countries in Africa or developed on the on the developed countries, as it were. Like I said, it's perception, but mean. Because you're not there, it is you're not in person. So you need some person. You need some technology that will allow you trust that these processes are what it should be, what international standards provide for. That is where we need the government. This is my thoughts on this. Yeah. So um, I, I thought you made an interesting point earlier. The fact that, well, what if you can't trust a government agency that's providing the certificates of trust, which is I don't know how you overcome that, but that's just an interesting point to think about. So real quick on the interaction between the, the government and the private sector, I think it's important the government sets the baselines and the frameworks for the private sector to help build trust. But if you want to move quickly and solve these issues faster, it's going to be up to the private sector. And the, the great thing about online transactions is that there can be a lot of transparency in the review system. So the, the moment that the platform, which is enabling those sales, or even an individual marketplace, individual seller, has a fraudulent transaction, people can make a big deal about it. People can rate them online in systems. People can tell their friends. So the customers are the ones who will probably do the quickest and most efficient way of enforcing that level of trust. OK, thank you, uh, Adam. That's, I mean, I could make a comment to Michael's question of governments being involved. I think there is a role for us. I think pointing out these issues uh, on, for instance, the certifying authorities and whether they are internationally uh, accredited is something that should be worked on on what the standards are for those, the way that the certification itself can be accepted, and the way that that information can be accessed securely and reliably is an issue. But I think there should be uh, a greater effort to try and drill down where the problems come from. I think we've had a lot of debate, and we get more and more information on the problems. I think there has to be a willingness to go and look to the small firms and understand from their point of view how those problems are expressed. So just the ease of being able to fill in a form online you know, access to that and being able to respond to some of these questions. You know, there are issues of literacy, but there are issues of understanding. And without the ability to respond to this, the governments have to make an effort to understand things from the point of view of, of, of enterprises and make that a whole lot easier for them. So uh, if, and let, perhaps we open up, we make a link to another question which was posed in two ways. Mary at the beginning about said, is there anything technology can do? And I think even at the end, we had a question about, uh, are there any uh, uh, s solutions that can help to do cross-border trade? So uh, perhaps one with, with, with Adam uh, on this, looking at you know, this, this problem of payments perhaps, I mean, we know that our, our payment on delivery is used in most of the developing countries for nearly all of this. You know, the countries like uh, Pakistan, we saw the statistics, statistics it's 95% payment on delivery, e-commerce. Uh, that's one of the things. Does, is, there, is there a solution, perhaps? And are there other interesting uh, technologies that could help with, with building trust, do you think? You know, while... The, the issue of payment delivery isn't going to be solved or changed very quickly. Um, by combining that with another technology, which is mobile payment, is an easy way forward whereby uh, when the package comes, you have a chance to inspect it, look at it, and easily click on your phone or some other device to say, all right, it's okay. But then that transaction is verified on the phone, and you have a little bit of safeguard in place to immediately go to the provider of that payment system and say, oh, by the way, I put that size 10 shoe on, and it fit, but then it fell apart the next day. 
So then that payment system has a duty or the ability to go back to the seller and withhold that payment. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's an easier way to um, to improve that that process and provide the safeguards and also uh, alleviates the problem whereby you have a delivery person carrying around a, a whole lot of cash. Uh, th th we'll we'll come about the experience in in Africa in a moment, and I'll let uh, Kohutin respond to that. But I wanted to make a link with another technology question because there was a thing about blockchain, perhaps there. And I and what I heard, you know, I translated this perhaps in a simple way of saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out is what I heard a little way. We've got this fantastic uh, distributed ledger system with amazing, you know, accuracy in it. But of course, you're interfacing with a real world system, a physical movement of cargo that may or may not be. Uh, contaminated or whatever, and that blockchain doesn't by itself say if it's contaminated or not. And it does pose questions, perhaps uh, there. Adam, do you have a comment? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in lightning round phase. I know the time is short, so I'll, I'll be, be quick on that. So um, that's a very good example of a blockchain is not ready for widespread use yet. It's in a testing phase. That's why I mentioned that government should be creating the sandboxes by which that can be tested safely, but you also need the, the backup situations, the real world, the, the processing that's happening, the, the paperwork that's that's needed as well. But it's important in those sandboxes that it's being monitored and you can improve upon the system. The timeline that I've heard from several companies implementing the technology is that 2017 was the year of design, 2018 would be the year of implementation and greater testing, 2019 is the year of iteration, and by 2020, three years from now, it'll be ready for prime time. But that's still three years away, very quickly, very quick uh, coming in terms of trade but and trade technology but a long way away when it comes to internet technology so that's just some of the time frame i've i've heard but uh, that's it's the human element that can't be taken out so a lot garbage in garbage out i guess yes you summarize it the best well there could be a point we come back there was a question about quality assurance here uh, at the end of trusted seal and perhaps that's a question but i believe there's at least one question that's come online so judy can you read it so let me just read um, the question uh, from a remote participant. It's uh, JC Finidori from UPU. So he asks, um, I've heard from the floor a very good statement about blockchain, referring to cargos of cotton, cocoa, sugar. It sounds, it reflects more on smart contracts stored on blockchains. And I'm interested to hear your panelists um, uh, say more about blockchain and uh, smart contracts and how it's linked to um, building uh, confidence and trust online. Okay, thanks, thanks, JC. I'm like, I think I'm, I'll pause that one and we'll see if we c come back to it because maybe it links about this issue of uh, certification at the end. But I wanted to let uh, Madame Diabati respond about the question about the uh, the the, the uh, African uh, Union and what, what what work could go on to stimulate cross border trade. Okay, merci. Uh, je reprends en français. Hein? Okay, je reprends en français. Uh, je reprends au Monsieur de l'UPAP qui a posé la question sur l'expérience de uh, des pays africains, enfin de, de la Poste sur le e-commerce. En Côte d'Ivoire particulièrement, uh, la Poste de Côte d'Ivoire est sur deux chantiers. La Poste de Côte d'Ivoire est aussi logisticien, c'est-à-dire qu'il achemine les, les colis et paquets. Et la Poste de Côte d'Ivoire est aussi acteur du e-commerce. Et nous pensons que euh, les postes d'Afrique doivent être euh, des, des acteurs euh, pré, principaux de, du commerce électronique. Et la Côte d'Ivoire a un site de la Poste de Côte d'Ivoire un site de e-commerce qu'on appelle Sans les Shops. Sans les Shops, c'est un site de e-commerce appartenant à la Poste de Côte d'Ivoire qui fait la promotion des produits locaux qui « made in Côte d'Ivoire ». Donc, ces produits, ça peut être de l'artisanat, de la poterie, des mmh. tissus, mmh. des habits, qui sont hébergés sur le site de e-commerce et qui sont euh, des e-commerçants qui sont recrutés par euh, la poste de Côte d'Ivoire, qui sont hébergés sur ces euh, sites de e-commerce. Donc, euh, voilà un peu, euh, de façon résumée, l'expérience le, de la Côte d'Ivoire sur, euh, euh, sur le e-commerce. Nous avons une, pratiquement une cinquantaine de e-commerçants sur notre site aujourd'hui, qui, qui nous permet d'avoir plus de visibilité sur les produits locaux made in Côte d'Ivoire et sur l'artisanat art, ivoirien. Donc, euh, ça nous permet de développer les PME locaux qui, euh, qui ont des possibilités comme ça 
de pouvoir vendre leurs produits aussi bien à l'extérieur qu'à l'intérieur de la Côte d'Ivoire. Merci. Okay. On va traduire. Uh, do we, uh, well, I'll, I'll let it lie in French for the moment. I think we've, uh, we'll, we'll come back because I believe that Hannah wanted to make an intervention here online. Okay, Hannah, thanks uh, for that uh, uh, reference to the work that we're doing and indeed uh, making uh, the emphasis on the need for training, which would be one of my messages in the very broad sense to train uh, both uh, companies on what it takes to produce a reliable service, uh, accede to the right level of quality and uh, keep their promises. I just mentioned, uh, you know, in resuming uh, Madame uh, Diabati's intervention from the Ivory Coast uh, uh, Post Office, is very much seeing the posts as a vector of some of that training. So the work that's going on there is really uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, training on what are good e-commerce products, how to get them online and providing logistic services, which is a very interesting thing that the, uh, the post office is in Africa, in Côte d'Ivoire, and the other countries can, can be doing. Um, there you go. We're almost at time. Was there um, uh, perhaps any other comment? Any other comments from from the uh, panelists? Um, uh, uh, sorry, I have, we have a question here on the left. Oh. Maybe not a question, just to add something that um, you talk about. Um, mainly Africa, but even in Europe, we're just working on the uh, report to remove online barriers to make easier. I'm, a, I'm sorry, I'm a member of the European Parliament. So we've been working now to try to harmonize a bit our systems to be able to order online from another country with and uh, not have your credit card rejected or to have um, the seller to avoid to sell to you. So these are things that we have not even addressed in, in Europe. So I think it is important. That's why IGF is important as a body because uh, we identify issues that we have to coordinate and harmonize uh, across uh, the world. Um, so I think it's important to understand that we're all at the same level basically and it's a uh, uh, internet maybe is the field where we should work faster together because we can uh, 
uh, have great uh, possibilities. And now in, in uh, Europe, I think next year we will be able to uh, export more easily in the European market as a, as a single market than we used to. For example, we used to export easier in China because there we have one system, one taxation, one legislation. In Europe, we had 28 different um, languages to deal with, so it was not very easy. Um, so I think we should maybe even try to move towards um, a body that would uh, coordinate the way we move forward with e-commerce. Because even you succeed to do it in Africa, then you have to have each member state of Europe uh, dealing separately with Africa. So I think it's important to find the ways to, to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is a comment here from the floor? Yes, uh, my name is Bredita. I'm coming from Indonesia, and I'm here with the Internet Society fellow. I would like to make a comment that um, the fact is, uh, in in supporting, in grow, in promoting the digital trade in Indonesia itself, we have many small medium enterprises. However, those who may have the need to import stuff, or even if myself wants to order stuff online from the abroad, we have problem with the import restriction. It is scattered, it is scattered mm, in many regulation. I mean, it has in the custom regulation, it has the Ministry of Health regulation, and many things. And I feel that. It is a problem on the awareness of the regulation and provision on the import uh, restriction. So uh, that's uh, one point. And the other one is for the SMEs who want to do export their product abroad, I think there is the need of, I don't know, maybe a platform or uh, a group where they can uh, understand the risk, the provision, the requirements, uh, of the country where they want to export their goods abroad because after all if their goods are rejected or being seized in the custom not delivered to the uh, customer then there will be no more trust and reputation built up for the SME itself. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sorry, just to say the, the geoblocking report, because I, I was the reporter from the industry committee, we managed to, to deal with the situation. We exclude the imports that are in a personal level and private level than what we import for a business uh, situation. So there they, you have to have some restrictions. Depends on the um, on the law that we have in each country. On the, um, um, for example, if you want to improve to import pharmaceutical, then you understand it's not very easy to achieve uh, um, uh, this e-commerce. But at the same time, we are at least we are gaining access to the content. So, for example, you used to not be able to access another site from your country, and somebody could uh, make it impossible for you to access a site in, uh, in Italy if you are from Germany. And also, so you were redirected to a different site. This is changing, so I, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to say a few things that are they're not even common sense yet. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we're at time there, our official time. We started a few minutes late, so maybe we can indulge and have a couple of minutes. If there are any uh, closing, I think here my fellow panelists are okay. Yeah, I'm great. Thanks. Okay, I don't know if Hannah wants to make a closing. Yeah. I would. Uh, I'm sorry. I think I'm not. I, I can't really take any more from the floor. Just make a closing comments. I'd like to thank my panelists, some of which have travelled uh, some way from Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire. Adam and I less so. Hannah, uh, who's already started her Christmas break on sweet in Sweden, but has interrupted it for us. So thank you very much for taking part. Thank you for finding us in this hidden hole. I would, I would put some uh, positive messages on this. We heard about some exciting technologies from from Adam, the exciting growth potential in Africa, of a of a of a continent that's going to double in size, the penetration of mobile, the future is as rosy as they say in French, le, the future ne manque pas d'avenir. One of those things is blockchain. We are, I have a question. We can't come back to what JC was asking about blockchain. This is not a blockchain session. But it's very exciting to uh, perhaps answer some of these things, which are for the future, about how quality certification and how real-world data can go in that. I think those are unsolved questions. We have lots of potential. We seem, seem to rush at technology, and we forget that actually there's a lot of hard work to be done, which is spreading the information about this, getting physical systems in order that people understand and correctly inform those systems, correctly comply to a quality standard. And then when we can collect the data, 
which is a big problem about getting it together, we can actually have reliable data through these increasingly reliable systems. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you for coming and have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you.